Good morning, church. Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2. It says this, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Does my help come from there? No. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 6. It says, we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Our amazing God, this creator, sustainer, redeemer, and judge, his heart for us is to help, to help us in time of need. When God created Adam, the first man, he said, it's not good he'd be alone. I will make him a helper. And so Eve was created. When Jesus was taken bodily from this earth, he said, it's good that I go. I will send you another helper, the comforter, the Holy Spirit. And why? Because God knows within our heart is a need for him, a need for one another, a need for help. No man is complete by himself. No man is an island is a phrase you've often heard. And in life, and particularly these times of lockdown, we realise even the little things, a conversation, a chat, a hug, a bit of company, we all need help. I'm an engineer. By nature, I tend to try to fix things myself. If I had a problem, I'll try and resolve it by myself. But I kind of hit a bit of a brick wall or a shut door this week. Uh, literally, I was in the office working on Friday. I was on a phone call. Wife was vacuuming. There was a bit of noise. So I did what you would obviously do. I closed the door. As soon as I did so, I remembered I've never ever closed that door before in the 20-something years we've had the house. And why? Because quite honestly, I'd never got round to fixing the fact I had a broken handle. The door now closed, I realised I was a prisoner in my office. So of course, as an engineer, you think of the two options. I could either ring for help, or I could open the window, shimmy down onto the conservatory roof, into the back garden, go round and open the door myself. Of course, I rang my wife, who's now downstairs, would you come and let me out? Within two minutes, much to her amusement of course, this engineer and husband was liber liberated. We all need help. And the truth is, whilst we need help from God in our fallen and broken humanity, we need to know his love for us, his redemptive plan. But also, God's heart is for the world that we live in, that we be helping his name. When Jesus taught that famous parable of the Good Samaritan, it ends with the often missed words, Go you and do likewise. So whoever your neighbour is, whoever, whoever is around about you, let's look to, as we come to our service this morning, let's listen to God's Holy Spirit prompting us for how to help others in his name and also to be reminded and confident that wherever we're going through today, God is our helper. And even those little things like getting us out of locked rooms, it's actually God's Holy Spirit that's helping to resolve and coordinate all of the physical and spiritual helps that we have need of. Be confident today our help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Welcome. We're going to pray in a moment. We're going to ask that God's Holy Spirit would guide us, help us, teach us, lead us, and awaken us, and enthuse us, and motivate us for God's work. We're going to spend time in his presence, praising and worshipping this God of all creation, who has framed all of this wonderful surroundings that we're in, all of time and space, and yet wants to help you and me in our time of need. We're going to spend time around the communion table as Phil Craig just brings a thought and leads us in communion. And then a mighty word from Pastor Brian Jingles. Let's pray. Father God, we're in awe of you. When we look at the stars, the galaxies, when we stand on the mountaintops, look at the beauty of your creation. Lord, just when we're in the middle of desperate, difficult situations and just see things working out, God, we know your master planning, awesome creating hand. Lord, the evidence is all around us. 
And Lord, the thought that you love us so much to have done so much, Lord, in our lives to show yourself to us. You've sent so many others to help us. Lord, you've positioned us in life, God, in a way we can help others in your name. God, I want to pray, Lord, awaken that consciousness in us, Father. Lord, that uh, the ministry of your Holy Spirit in us is our helper, but prompts us to help others. God, I want to pray as we come to worship you today that we will just be mindful of some of these things you have done for us, where you have shown your name as Jehovah Ezra, our helper, a very present help in time of need, as your word says. I want to pray, Lord, as, uh, that your anointing be upon this service. Lord, that all of it, God, would be used for, uh, Lord, our spiritual development, God, in you, but also to, uh, to prompt us to go and do likewise in your name. Amen. The team are going to lead us in a time of praise and worship. As I would always say to you, turn the volume up. Don't be worried who's standing watching. Raise up your hands and give glory and honour to our wonderful, loving God who has done all of this for us. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's of worth, that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not Search much deeper within to the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you. Till I lay in my head, I 
Thank you, team, and what a God. Phil Craig is going to lead us now in a time of communion. So I would encourage you, if you're not ready yet, go stop, pause, go get the elements, and just spend time uh, as Phil would bring a thought, just in God's presence this morning, and then share the bread and wine together. Thank you, Phil. Good morning. It's lovely to be with you this morning as we share today in uh, the Lord's Supper. Remembering his past sacrifice, his future return, and his abiding presence with us. As I was thinking uh, what I would share with you this morning, my, my thoughts were drawn to uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 26. I've been reading through the, the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, in that verse, the Lord talks to the, the disciples and uh, he says to them, you are more valuable, you have more worth than sparrows. So the context is that Jesus is saying, if you seek first the kingdom uh, and its righteousness, then everything you need will be supplied to you by God. And so in that context, he says, look, God provides for the sparrows, you are of more value, more worth than the sparrows. God is obviously going to provide for you as well. And it's that thought of our worth before God that, that I want to bring to you this morning. At times we can question our own worth and our own value. I know there was a stage in my life uh, whenever in, in a work context I was no longer able to, to do what I had been doing and as a consequence uh, I suddenly questioned who I was and what I was about because all of my, personally as I saw it, all of my worth and value was tied up in the, the role that I was performing. Uh, but for each of us, at times we can we can question ourselves in that way. But the scripture encourages us that you and I are valued by God. We are loved by him and nothing can separate us from his love. As we now turn to take the bread and the wine, I want you to consider the, the following verse. And to, to consider it uh, with that thought in mind, uh, my worth in God's eyes, my worth to God. The verse is, is Romans 5, verse 8, and I'm reading from the New International Version. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You are loved by God. What is our worth? As we come to the Lord's Supper now, look to Christ dying on the cross. All of this was done for you. Amen. Turn now to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. 
Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your love for each one of us. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice on our behalf. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence within us. And as we come now to partake of these elements, this bread and this wine, help us, Lord, to realize and to see the depth of your love for us. Amen. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, broken for you. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, shed for you. Amen. The word this morning comes from Brian, Pastor Brian Jingles. But just before we, we listen, and I hope you're ready to take notes, let's just read some verses from Mark chapter 8, verses 34 to 38. It says this, Then calling the crowd to join his disciples, he, that's Jesus, said, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my message in these adulterous and sinful days, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in the glory of his Father and with his holy angels. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that everyone who hears this message or sees this message and hears it, Lord, will be blessed with a fresh revelation of Jesus Christ. And Father, what you want us to do, what, what you require of us at this time, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, hello to all of you. Uh, it's good to be back with you. And today I want us to look at a question of priorities, a question of priorities. Jesus was asked many questions. Uh, during his earthly ministry. And indeed, he also asked questions. And asking questions is a very good way to get people thinking. I used to ask my A-level students a lot of questions, most of which I answered myself. But it, it is an attempt to get us thinking along the lines desired by the questioner. Now here's a question that Jesus asked in Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 36. And this will be the thread that connects the various ideas in this sermon. This is what he said to a, a crowd of people, including his disciples. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall it profit a man? In other words, what's the benefit to us if we gain everything the world has to offer us, but we end up losing our soul? A question of priorities. And really that question of Jesus, like a scalpel, cuts right through our fuzzy thinking to the central issue in our lives. What is really important to you and to me. Is it our eternal soul or is it the things that this world has to offer us? I want to apply that question critically to three groups, three groups of people, distinctive groups of people, and you, the listener, will fall into one of these groups at least. 
Uh, the first group are those of you who have yet to ask Jesus into your heart as your Savior and Lord. The most important transaction that any human being can make. And I want to exhort you to listen carefully to what I'm about to say because it could change your eternal destiny. And may God speak to you himself by his spirit. There is a disease in this world that is always fatal and everyone has it. It's a disease called sin. Sin is fatal because it separates us from God. It destroys our bodies. It destroys our minds, our emotions, our relationships. Sin is always fatal. And even worse than that, it is eternally fatal because the Bible speaks about eternal punishment for those who haven't dealt with their sin. Now, how do I know that sin is relevant to all of us? Well, in Romans 3, 23, Paul wrote this, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So sin is falling short of God's desire for your life and my life. Sin is selfishness. It is breaking the commandments of, of the law, the Lord, and it's falling short of his glory. It's missing the mark that he has set for our lives. There's a great deal of talk at the moment about vaccination. But vaccination is not a cure, it's a preventative measure. The cure for sin is only one thing, and that is the blood of Christ's atonement. Jesus died on a cross for you and for me. And until we ask the Lord for his forgiveness and receive it by faith, we are sinners and we're destined to an eternity away from God. Jesus did not die for victims. You and I can feel sorry for ourselves. You may have had a very difficult life, but Jesus did not die for victims. He died for sinners. Why did Jesus have to die? Well, the simple answer is that God takes sin much more seriously than we do. Sin is so destructive that a loving God has to deal with it one way or the other. Now the good news for you, if you've never received Christ as your savior, the good news for you is in Ephesians 2 verse 8, and it says this, for by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of your work yourselves, it is the gift of God. How do you become a Christian? Two things. You need to repent of your sin. Say to God, I'm sorry for my sin. Leave it at the foot of the cross. Believe that Jesus died to carry away your sin. And here's the wonderful news, that when you are given salvation, there is no more condemnation for you. Sin has been cured, and the power of sin in your life has been broken. Now the second group of people to whom I want to apply this question, for what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul, is those who believe in a social gospel. A social gospel focuses primarily on making people's human condition better. And that's a good thing. But it doesn't deal with the sin issue in their life. It doesn't cleanse them from that which God sees as the most serious issue. Do you remember this is a question of priorities? And the priority for God, for every human being on this planet, is to deal with sin. 
Let's take a fictitious person called John. John comes to church, everybody's excited, uh, he's loved, he's, he's welcomed, etc. People take him under his wing. Uh, if he has money problems, they're maybe helped. Uh, if, he, if he needs better housing, that can be sorted out. Uh, education can be provided, a CV can be written, people will pray for John. And that's all very kind, and it's wonderful, and it's important. But if you and I really love John, we will tell him that he's got an incurable illness, that only the blood of Christ can cleanse away. It's the difference between kindness and love. For God so loved the world that he sent his son to die for John. John's a fictitious person. But you and I will meet many people who have never heard the gospel, don't know about sin, don't know about the need for repentance and salvation. The social gospel will make somebody's life more comfortable, but what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and ends up losing his soul? If you and I truly love John, we will tell him about God's priority. The third group of people are, of course, Christians. And this, pat, this verse that I've read out to you is from a passage that I want to read to you. It's Mark chapter 8, verse 34 to 38. I want you to visualize this and listen to Jesus' words. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Going back to John, everybody in this world loves people helping them, loves people giving them money, giving them aid of all kinds. Who wouldn't? We all love that. And it's very necessary, and the Bible is very practical. But we need to tell John not just about repentance and salvation, but also the cost of following Jesus. This is not easy believism. This is not a comfortable ride to heaven. Listen again to what Jesus said. Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself. We saw in Ephesians 2 that salvation is a free gift. But discipleship costs us everything. It's all about laying down our lives and living his life, or letting him live his life through us, I should say. We're to take up our cross. We're to deal with sin. Yes, you and I as Christians need to confront sin in our lives and apply the same basic lessons of repentance and receiving forgiveness for it. Jesus does not give them a comfortable, easy message here. He goes on to say in verse 35, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. So being a Christian in many nations in the world today involves laying down your life, literally laying down your life. It's a lovely story about Richard Wurmbrandt who was imprisoned for a long time. And there was a room in his prison where prisoners were sent to after being tortured or they got sick. And basically they were sent there to die. His testimony is that nobody failed to become a Christian in that room. 
Whenever I hear stories of people who suffer for Christ, or even martyred for Christ, I recall words like this, words of Jesus. If we could just have a glimpse of eternity, either with God or without God, our priorities would change also. Why should anyone be prepared to lay down their life, to suffer the way people like Rembrandt suffered, many others like him, through the centuries? Well, I believe it's because they had a revelation that it's better to be with Christ forever and suffer in this world in the meantime than to try to gain every pleasure and every comfort that the world has to give but end up losing out. Then we come to the verse that is our priority question, verse 36. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall, he goes on to say, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What is worth? What's it worth to you? What's your soul worth to you? I believe there's somebody listening to this talk and God wants to tell you so lovingly that your soul is precious. It's the eternal part of you. It's the part that will live on long after our concerns about careers and sports and money and wealth and housing and all the rest of it. All the things that we get so preoccupied with. What shall we exchange for us, our soul? Well, I pray that you will exchange nothing for your soul, that you will value it because God gave it to you. And then unremitting challenge in the final verse. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Now notice, not only ashamed of Jesus, but ashamed of Jesus' words. That's the gospel. Let's go back to John for a moment, our fictitious uh, visitor to the church. Why do we not tell him about salvation? Why do we not tell him about repentance and sin and why Jesus went to the cross. Well, there could be any number of reasons. Sometimes we just want to be nice people who don't want to give offense. Sometimes we think, well, they may react badly if I tell them about that. But listen again to what Jesus says. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words... Of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed. I, I feel a challenge today from the Lord to me personally. That I should never be ashamed of Jesus. I should never be ashamed of his gospel. And I should not peddle a cheap, easy Christianity that never mentions sin never challenges people to lay down their lives for Jesus and take up their cross and follow him. Because it is my belief that in these strange times through which we are living, God is preparing us for a future which is uncertain in many ways. We're coming to depend more and more on God and less and less on the world around us. So what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love, your love that expressed itself so sacrificially in the death of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. And it's my prayer, Lord, that anyone listening to this will have a deep revelation of our wonderful Savior. And Lord, that we will not be ashamed of you and that we will not be ashamed of your words so that when you return, 
you will have no cause to be ashamed of us. Help me, Lord. Help us all by your Spirit, for you know how weak we are. We need your help in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Brian, and thank you for joining with us this morning. We hope that you have been blessed and challenged in equal measure. Uh, in the week ahead, please remember and be mindful of others and be mindful of opportunities, looking for opportunities to reach out to others in Jesus' name. Do link up with the prayer meetings via Zoom and then come join us on the Bible study Wednesday night via Zoom with Mark Anderson and then come back and join again next Sunday as Pastor Brian Jingles brings another word from the Lord. In the meantime, stay faithful where God's placed you. In Jesus' name, amen.